The Clockwork Castle is a medium to small scale mod that includes a story driven campaign and new content that is typical of DLC style mods such as a new home and new places to explore and such other things like that. Now skip ahead here if you don't want to hear this part and just want to listen to the review. I just want to address some things really quickly with uh, some new people uh, here. Uh, first off, there's always like two or three Spurgs that rage and dislike the video, but if their comment, if they leave one, has no substantive counter argument. So they're just spazzing out. I'll just say right now to them, uh, and this is the old, only time I'll ever address them, you're wasting your time if you're doing that. I don't I don't care. I don't care about your stupid raging comment. The second thing is, uh, this is the second time someone has complained about Worm's Tooth. Look, if you can show me evidence that Worm's Tooth plagiarized Skyrim or other mods, which is the claim, then I will retract my score of it. But I need to see evidence to to do that, okay? And finally, a couple people have inquired about the numbers and the qualification of the level design of some of these mods. So I don't use the terms good or bad when you say this is a good mod. That doesn't mean anything to me. Uh, it's, it's just fluff because the term good and bad, it's overly subjective and you're most likely using it in an egocentric manner. I can't read your mind, so I don't know what you mean by good or bad. As far as inquiring into the methodology, I put a link in the description. So the summary of the supportive reasoning and evidence is all there in the video of the review or article for a certain score of a certain mod. So if you're wondering how I got to that score, you can look at the, the way that the, the methodology is composed, link in the description, and then you can look at the reasoning, right? And we can go further along if you think that the that the reasoning doesn't reflect the score or something like that, but everything is all there for you. Um, this scoring method is not a raw number and is m meant to reflect a Pareto distribution. This is not just a system where numbers are thrown out and there's a uniform scale. The component aggregate is more similar to a percentile value than a raw score. It is not a percentile value, but it is more similar to one than a raw score. So again, if you're interested in what exactly these numbers mean, I have a link to the website in the description. There's also articles that come out every so often that elaborate on the meanings of the subcomponents, why they're relevant and how they can be estimated, etc. It should also be obvious that this scoring methodology approaches analysis from a holistic perspective, so visual design components outweigh the rest, but not necessarily in a way that outweighs the value of interactivity because of the subcomponents. So the designer of Clockwork Castle demonstrates their ability to construct structure using additive architecture far more than subtractive architecture. And while that may indicate a deficiency in the latter case as compared to the amount of object manipulation done, that is static mesh manipulation mainly, in Skyrim for subtractive architecture, it still stands as evidence of the formulation of structure that pays attention to space rather than matter. So in other words, you can think of architecture in a more fundamental sense, which is a geometric one, a room would be subtractive in that you're removing empty space from the area once you create it. And now that the whole area that the room occupies is traversable by the player, that that is subtractive architecture in the sense, again, you're subtracting emptiness. Whereas a pillar inside a room would be additive in that you're adding the occupation of space to a traversable area. A lot of attention is paid to subtractive architecture in Skyrim, which is then detailed. And additive architecture is usually conventional and doesn't play with all three dimensions. So for example, pillars, statues, inner hallways, etc. are typical to Skyrim, but not so much flying catwalks and platforms as is the case in, in this mod. And so this is one thing that is somewhat unique to this mod, and it acts as a substance for the qualification 
of overall structure and innovation. The evidence mostly being encountered in the Duemer underground levels, most especially the sick bay, where that kind of mesh placement is used most obviously. The catwalks connect towards the center of one of the rooms, for instance. In most cases within the levels, as it is in general, what composes most of the traversable areas is subtractive. And in those cases, areas are stripped down to their bare geometry in essentially most of the mod. Most of the portions in which the player is interacting through most of the main quest is the Dwemer underground, which indicates an absence of architectural detailing altogether. And as a thought experiment, you could imagine that it might be useless to conceive that architecture ought to be equated exactly with Euclidean geometry, and that the definition results in a fractal in which you can continuously subdivide a geometric space up to an infinitesimal point. So even if we wanted to talk about architecture in that way, it's not as useful in a theoretical sense, let alone a practical sense. The point being that there's little use in saying that the base geometry is architecturally relevant when we want to differentiate the quality of design across levels. And furthermore, we shouldn't be interested in the boundary of interactive architecture, that is the geometric boundary. Probably the best way to think of this is, uh, is the Jordan curve theorem, uh, which is the most fundamental distinction between an interior and exterior, exterior region. The point being that we can imagine that we have a boundary and we're analyzing the things that are within the boundary, but not the boundary itself. So we shouldn't be interested in the boundary of interactive architecture, which is all the traversable space in which the player acts, but what is inside it for the same reason relating to geometry that I mentioned. What is within the boundary counts, which is the topography, the formation of shapes within the boundary, etc. and visually the motifs, detailing, patterns, etc. So when you see a simple corridor with nothing in it, you may begin to gain an intuitive sense of what it means to have quality structure. It's not just an empty room. It has to be more than that. How does the designer form the space of the room and the topography of the whole level in an orderly way? How is it detailed and decorated? Those are universal ideas. And when it comes to the creation engine, we can begin to further detail what we know to be boundaries so as to distinguish base geometry from architecture. What are the static meshes that compose the boundary, for example? So here there is certainly the existence of structure and it is sufficient in that the designer composes it all in a manner that harmonizes different spaces together into a whole that, th that the player can traverse. As far as the visual portion, however, little detailing is done when it comes to the dungeon set pieces as far as motifs and detailing goes. But there is something to say about innovation, topping my point about the crafting of additive shapes, which is that the author plays with set pieces in a way that demonstrates attempts to create innovative architectural detailing. The best example of this mod's ability to personalize atmosphere comes from the introduction where you get a clear sense of an eerie mood that carries on for most of the time elapsed in that area. The problem is that even within the keep and the cave, the atmosphere is lost to vast, empty spaces that seem to want to convey a sense of daunting size, but none of the visual elements in them work together in a very cooperative way so as to convey a strong sense of any mood. Sound variation and atmospheric characterization via sound doesn't fare well as compared to a typical Skyrim crypt, so that's something to say for auditory immersion. There's also something to say about elements external to what typically make up atmosphere that seem to be intended to reinforce the mood. For example, the ghost person that was effective in the beginning, but the whole point of a jump scare or any sort of attempt at stimulating emotions of fear from the player is to do so in a way that keeps the player on the edge. 
So the stimulus in question must not be normalized, and the player must not be conditioned by it to the point that they are accustomed to it in a way that strips the instigation of fear from the stimulus. This is very basic human psychology. Once the designer kept the ghost there for an extended period of time, the whole sense of mystery and intimidation vanished as compared to the intensity of the introduction. The fact that the ghost followed you under the ice did not make the experience any better, it just made it goofier. So in the end, what could have been a stimulating, frightful experience dissolved into a bunch of odd mechanics. The same issue is found in the skulls turning towards you. If it had been done one time in a subtle way, it would have been far more effective than what the result actually was, which was that the skulls kept looking at you, and you could play with them, and all the eeriness of the scene was gone. So in the end, the ghost went from what could have been a mysterious and eerie figure to a lady with clown makeup on that made ambulance noises. Since the mod struggles with immersion in the first place, it suffices to say that atmospheric detailing doesn't go very far. Much of the duration of the quest is spent in the Dwemer underground, where the interiors have almost no atmosphere, and where the lighting is plain and unconvincing, and does nothing to help the already lacking atmosphere. The main cave salvages this somewhat, but does nothing in terms of conveying a sense of mood so much as it does provide strong visuals. On average, the levels collectively don't convey a sense of conceptual grandness so strongly that everything is uniquely recollected individually, but the author does demonstrate their ability to implement it, which is sort of a double-edged sword in this case, because some cases you can see it and in some cases it's rather absent or approximately so. The best case being the main underground cave, which is a sort of large Dwemer structure above molten lava and water reservoirs alike. But the remainder of the levels are boxed into the usual Dwemer d descriptions and don't stand out as especially maverick. The visual awe brought about by the combination of lighting and layout in the main cave does well to complement its concept and some of the imagery in the clockwork castle helps with this too. The combination of contraptions and new textures painted onto a vanilla mesh was not only something new, but was done in a way that made an impression as it wasn't expected, and the visual themes blended together in the interiors. The mundaneness of most of the Dwemer cells, however, also pushed back to give an overall result of a mixing of typical and new that didn't pack as much of a punch as it could have. A lot of what keeps the freshness within the mod is the gameplay, and the entertainment is largely driven by the events which are distinguished from typical introductions into dungeons. The horror game setup caused intrigue which fueled curiosity enough to get to Clockwork Castle itself. The new ideas that sprung up there were enough to fuel curiosity to motivate the player up until the entrance of the Dwemer Underground, where the player converges to conventionality for the most part. The item fetching task, reminiscent of classic RPG questing, allowed the player a way to explore much of the Dwemer Underground, but the back and forth that was forced upon the player did not help any sense of excitement as being forced to go through the same area over and over with little change in that interactivity reduces the freshness of the surroundings. What did help was that the player was doing different things in each quest anyway. The finale, which is uh, basically a decently challenging fight against the boss and some henchmen, was an appropriate one as the ending of the quest went out with a better bang than most. And all of this was done within a new environment, no less. It also says something about the intensity. Everything was balanced in a moderate way for the most part, but there was nothing that was especially combat or work intensive that really was set up in an optimal way to where it was so challenging 
that the player wanted to keep going, but not too challenging that they would just give up. And that's sort of the sweet spot that every modder would want to be in. The novel portions of the gameplay composed the lesser fraction of them, as most of the questing was typical, but the relevance of the novelty goes far as it carries the player through a large portion of the quest. Similarly, the flux was well moderated for the most part, except when fetching Dwemer scraps, which may have stuttered some players and served as somewhat of a grind, though not entirely. There's also something to be said about technical execution in terms of some elements of, of the mod that don't really entirely fit into the analysis, but are no less interesting in that they are kind of creative additives uh, to what would otherwise be a normal mod, such as the teleporter mechanism and all that, basically the rewards you get after completing the quest. So there is, after all, something to go after uh, by completing the quest or to venture towards while you're completing the quest. The two main characters the author introduces are described in detail through the conversations the player can have with them, although much of the time is spent recollecting history and telling the player of things, as opposed to a more personality-driven development as seen in Enderal, for instance, where the character's personality sort of unravels in parallel with the plot. Simultaneously, the plot is explained through steps of the questing process, and despite it being topically linear and simple, it is straightforward and clear to understand and adds a bit of interest to the questing experience. There isn't anything I can point to so clearly as far as emphasis on narrative and theme as far as the nature of the plot, and there's some deference to lore where there may have been otherwise an anticipation of thematic driving force behind a quest or something like that, or a strong one at least, or maybe a combination of lore and na narrative. Ultimately, this mod is a relatively short tale in which the author presents various creative elements, typically in a mutually independent way, and in the end gives the player a distinct questing experience in its own personal style. <laughs>